Good afternoon, HEU. Good afternoon, sisters and brothers. I'm honored to be here. In the labor movement, when we address each other as brother or as sister, there's a sense of connection, a sense of solidarity, and community of common interests and values, regardless of language, race, color, gender, sexual orientation, faith, and ability. In a sense, we are each other's keeper. I came to Canada in 1968 as a student leaving my family in Hong Kong. Little did I know that in less than a decade, I would have joined a whole new labor family as a new union organizer with the International Ladies' Garment Workers Union. How many know that that's the former body of Unite here? And I want to start off by sharing something quite personal here. It's there are three experiences that have defined me in, as an activist. My first summer job in Montreal was working in Queen Elizabeth Hosp uh, Hotel sorry, in Montreal as a chambermaid. Then now it's the room attendants. Um, in my dark gray uniform, I make 17 rooms a day at $1.25 an hour. I experience sexual and racial harassment from guests, and yet as a young worker then, I was too ashamed and too scared to complain. I didn't do anything and just walk away. After four months, I was able to return back to the comfort of learning, knowing that and leaving a lot of the immigrant women, women of color, who face that reality on a daily basis. So it's that sense of guilt of leaving and the rage of my own silence that had prompted me to continue to speak out and be an advocate and an activist. The second experience is as a daughter, watching my mother, who's a former sewing machine operator, at the age of 60 being told that she was too slow and she was wasting a sewing machine. The third incident is as a, as a mother, hearing that about my daughter being told to go back where she came from when she was actually born in Toronto Women's College Hospital. These experiences strengthened my resolve to be a labor activist, a feminist, and an anti-racist activist. I still remember the first house visit as a young organizer that I made to a garment workers in 1977. At the kitchen table, surrounded by her family members, she signed my first union card. Now, 35 years later, I can still recall that sense of responsibility when she handed me that card. It is that workers' trust, her sense of hope for the future, and courage that has kept me humble and hopeful all these years. My story is not unique. I'm sure all of you here have your own compelling stories of struggle and lived experiences. Many of you, I'm sure, got involved in HEU or in the labor movement because you experienced injustice on the jobs at some point and someone gave you a hand. Right? How many of you did that, got involved like that? Yeah. And all of us are here because we share common values of social and economic justice, of equity and equality. As an activist, we do it on a daily basis because women workers are still making more than 20 cents less than their male counterparts. We do this on a daily basis as activists because workers are subject 
to sexual harassment, racial harassment, and other mobility challenges in our workplaces. And in workplaces, particularly in the service and hospitality sector that I'm familiar with, there are still incidents where the skin color of the staff members gets darker as you go from the front of the house to the back of the house. And also as activists, we are outraged by the growing gap of income inequality. You still remember in 1989, the House of Commons unanimously adopted a motion saying we'll end child poverty in the year 2000. Now 12 years into the new millennium, we have a growing gap on child poverty. One in six children in Canada live below poverty line. 50% of those children come from Aboriginal communities and 40% from racial, racialized communities, people of color. Children are poor because their parents cannot find decent work that pay living wage, and that's a shame. In the context of public austerity agenda, the attacks on public services and anything union is fast and vicious. And in a way, I'm so glad I'll, I'm taking a break from Toronto, where we have a buffoon of a mayor <laughs> who will refer to anyone who is, I have a union job to be on a gravy train. And a premier who has preempted and undermine the collective bargaining and put in the anti-strike legislations and denying people, all of us as workers, the teachers, the right to strike. And on top of that, we now also have a federal government that passed last June an omnibus bill that will make it so much easier for employers to bring in temporary foreign workers and pay them less, 15% less than, than the prevailing wages. And so in, now in workplaces, not on, only do we have contract workers, full-time workers, agency workers, part-time workers, we now also have just-in-time labor from the global south, not coming as immigrants with lender status, but coming as indentured labor. In this political climate of precarious employment and where unions are constantly under attack, it's so easy and it's so tempting for all of us to get into the blaming game, blaming those who are more vulnerable than we are. And this is where we need to collectively reimagine and come up with new ways of building that would counter that politics of divisions and fear, that would expose the root cause on who's benefiting from this structural inequalities, exposing those who are the 1%. And this is where I find your convention theme on building unions, building the future to be so forward-looking. When you build the unions, you are also lifting every up, everyone up. You are holding the standard and building the community. And to me, the labor movement is part of the larger community where we all share visions that no one needs to stand alone. It is in that vision that I like to underscore and make it more explicit that building the union, building future, building the future should be for all, and I underscore for all, not just for a few, but for all of us. And then one of this, <laughs> one of the uh, sticky notes out there is saying, H-E-U cares for all. And to me, I think that's a perfect slogan. Right? The, and to me, the grounding of building the future for all lies in the principle of how we interact and how we link equity 
solidarity and justice, those three pieces together. Solidarity is the spirit of our labor movement. It is what gives us courage and goosebumps at the same time, right? That's the story of us that gives us hope. I'm sure you all have such transformative experiences when you walk on the picket lines, when you do your organizing, when you elect someone that you really care about. And those are the pieces. And that sense of solidarity, it's what gives us, it's the unison in actions that we can stop, we can do, continue to chant, the stomping, the chanting, to end oppressions and exploitations of workers all over the world. It's solidarity, it's about building the unity within the 99% and that we'll, so that we'll have the power to resist the 1%. I mean, I did my research on the meaning and practices of solidarity. Some of the images, if I, I'm sure if I, ask, if I ask you, you know, what do you see, what, when I say the word solidarity, what's your first image? Um, I'm sure you have lots of different interesting visual images. Um, when I did the research, there were some who said solidarity is like a solar pa a system. You can't do one without the other. The, or it's like the genetic codes, unless someone is really into scientifics. And then or the linking of arms. And to me, solidarity is the rising of our cringe, clinch fists. Just do that together. Let's say one, two, three, solidarity. It's that sense of collapsing together. And the, you know, the fingers don't go all even, all the same size and same length, but it's the collapsing of that fist and raising it that we are one. And to me, this is where the equity comes in. If Solidarity is the why of the labor movement. Then to me, equity is the how. Solidarity is the spirit of the movement and equity is the glue so that we can punch out as one. And because the enemy, brothers and sisters, it's out there, right? And so when we talk about in the, in the slogan, diversity is our strength, how are we gonna make it real? How do we integrate equity in everything that we do and respect each other's space? When we sing solidarity forever, in its, what we see and what we sing as ideal, how do we mesh up in practice? Is solidarity truly for ever, and is solidarity truly for all. For a lot of workers who have lost their jobs, who've been laid off, who are victims of plant closures, they have said, just because I lose my job, it doesn't mean I have to lose my union. So how do we link and make sure they're part of, still part of the union family? For in, in terms of the practice of solidarity for all, I want to share with you some of the quotes in talking in research, doing, talking to Aboriginal trade union activists and workers of color activists. And just give you a sense. The question is, why am I being left behind? Why can't the leadership see beyond my color or hear beyond my accent? Why am I treated as a one-trick pony only to be included in human rights and anti-racism events? I'm sharing these because there's a sense of profound disappointment on what we could do differently. And at the same time, there's so much potential among all of us to build an inclusive working class movement where equity it's not just an optics to be seen as doing something right. And that just because we have women, a number of wor workers of color on certain leadership positions, it doesn't mean 
we've done solidarity. Equity does not mean treating everyone the same. Equity is about, we need the equity before we can get into the equality or equal opportunities. Equity is about recognizing that there has been historical and systematic and systemic barriers that have kept back women, people of color, people with disability, Aboriginal workers, and LGBTQ members. HGU has been at the forefront in championing and fighting off on pay equity issues and won millions for the members. And it's those actions that address and dismantle the systemic barriers that said oh, it's okay to pay women less. And I wish maybe not in my granddaughter's generation, maybe my great-granddaughter's generations, we won't have to do with pay equity legislations because everyone will be treated the same. And that's our... And, and equity to me is about how we reflect and examine our own privilege, very often by birth. And that can be referred as unearned privilege. It's as, as for me as an able-bodied person. How do, I, uh, how do I use my unearned privilege to make it more accessible and to support people with disability so they're not going on to the front of the line, but rather to be included in the line at least. And, and that to me, it's the only right thing to do if we want to build that solidarity. And how do we, at, within the trade union movement, while we might be as Reverend Jesse Jackson had said, while we might be divided by race, how do we unite it by class? How do we stand as allies to each other's issues and see all of them as union issues? And equity agenda is for the long haul. It's just as messy as democracy practices. How do we engage in those difficult conversations about power, privilege, and positions without guilt, defensiveness, or remorse? How do we stay in those conversations and stay with each other without walking away or giving up on each other? How do we make room for each other? And this is where the humility and the grace come in. How do we know when to step up, when to step back, and when to step aside so others could also have that chance and that space without breaking that solidarity? And to me, this is where the heart comes in. We do a lot of the here, the head, the hands, our feet, walking on the picket lines, but here, it's where the love of our movement comes in, the love for social justice come in. And that, the love, would inspire us to be more courageous and more generosity in our spirit. To me, that's the same approach that we need to take as trade unionists in building alliance with community groups. It's about learning, taking the time, to build relationship, to listen to each other, to have healthy debates, knowing that at the end of the day, we'll come out stronger together. And it requires us to share less of our egos and more of our 
good cheer, solidarity in our space. It's all also about learning to walk with each other for the long haul. In coalition building, it's not, we're not just creating an instantaneous crowd for the photo op and for the media when we need them to come on the show, to show the solidarity, to show the diversity. And sometimes the community groups also use us as labor, as the ones that have the cash and that have the resources. But if we can go beyond that, and I think in part of that building community, building community alliance, is also about building relationship with community partners on developing value-based campaign, not issue-based campaign. I mean, issue-based campaign, but issue-based campaign that's framed in some common shared values. For example, uh, recently, last year in Toronto, we fought to stop the privatizations of a, close to a thousand public services cleaners jobs from pre stopping them from getting contracted out and maintaining the union wages. Instead of saying it's saving the jobs, we c come together with the community groups that say, we have, this is a value campaign on defining what's based on the shared value of strong public services, healthy communities, and healthy growing up spots for fam workers and their families. And so it's in that sense, recognizing that it's more than, yes, it's about the jobs, but it's about the values that we share and hold dear together. And to me, I think it's important in saying in reaching out to the communities and building, in this building the union, building the future, it's, we also recognize that among the myths, among all of us here, the rank and file members, in addition to being a card holding mem union member, you are also parents, board members of a residence associations, hockey moms, soccer coaches, active members on the different congregations, different faith, boards on the shelters, and leaders of different cultural organizations. These are untapped resources for our unions in reaching out and building permanent, more long-term coalitions with communities. These are untapped resources that has deep roots in the community. How do we harness them so it becomes a powerful tool of networking. And how do we start that process of getting to know our local activists, our local shop stewards, our local leadership on a much more meaningful manner? A lot of times we rush from meetings to meetings and too often without meeting each other from here. Right. And and here, that's, I think it'll be a really interesting idea. You know, remember way back when, when we do union organizing, when you first, before you became a union member, people come to your door and knock, right? Do house visit. People come and talk to you. There was an intensive courting process, right? How do we, can we do that again within our own locals? You know, within the each unit, having some, our leadership, local leadership, go and do house visits with our, our informal leaders within our different units, different workplaces, and get to know them at that level. So we know what they're involved in, what their interests, and how we can bring them along as well. And maybe in different units, different workplaces, there could be solidarity committee they might not be the shop stewards, they could be the solidarity reps as a way of part of that building, as a different way of bring, bringing them on side and be more involved rather than them just watching and as a dues paying members. I think mean, that's in my years of organizing, 
there's nothing more powerful than to hear when members start switching from saying I to saying we. And that's... <laughs> and that, that's a very simple but profoundly meaningful word, we. And so it's pa that part of the building of the we that we need to find ways of integrating equity because that's the glue that we could build a stronger solidarity. The other suggestions, and this is my, my dream, is what if we have in different, work, in different union meetings, in different workplaces, in addition to having the formal meeting with the agenda, that we hold a, the solidarity circle dialogue. If there's one thing that we need to learn and be humble, it's the teaching of the indigenous community, the Aboriginal learnings. The, the circle format, in a way, it's the, re, the telling, the active listening, and retelling of the stories of our own histories. And it's uh, the telling, in the telling and the retelling, it's an active form of resistance. And so how do we make sure the, the history of HEU is shared among those who are new members? It's being told in an intergenerational method. It's being told as a way for both to, for all of us from the diverse backgrounds to unlearn some of the garbage we collected over all these years, right? To unpack, but also to relearn what makes sense, what's the recovered, what's the real history of the labor movement, re, real history of the Canadians in this land. And one of the quotes I will always remember is by Rosemary Brown, the first black Canadian BC member of MLA. And, and she said, in Canada, aside from the Aboriginal people, the first people, we are all immigrants or refugees, or descendants and descendants and descendants of immigrants and refugees. And I think it's in that sense that we need to start building and start bridging and making sure that whatever we do, we are here to build an inclusive working class movement. And that respect and that co-responsibility, it's what's going to keep us going and counter that politics, the right-wing populist politic of division, divide and rule, and the fear. And so lastly, I just want to say organizing and mobilizing is about challenging the status quo, exposing the unequal power relations. It's about reimagining what a just society, what a fair workplace, what an inclusive union, what a healthy community should look like, sound like, and feel like. The three words I want to leave with you is people, power, change. It's how do we organize people so they feel they have the power to make the changes they want to see in the community. And those three words, it's how do we build them together? How do we, in that the building of linking people power change, that we integrate equity, solidarity for justice? And, <laughs> and keep remembering the powerful word of we. So in a way, the building of the unions, building of the future, building of the community is the beginning of the building of we, or the consolidations of the building of we. As a progressive union, HEU has a great track record on equity issues. And with this new project in the next two years with your new strategic directions, you're gonna be at the cutting edge of the, all the full labor movement. The possibility of building 
on such powerful combinations of equity, solidarity, and justice. So I salute all of you in your visions, your leadership on this journey. It's time to put equity and solidarity in practice. It's time to do it with your heads, your hands, your feet, and about all your hearts. I'll end, <laughs> I'll end with a quote from a Cree histor oral historian who said, I teach what I know as an act of love. And to all of you as activists, as leaders, what you're about to embark on and what you do every day is also an act of love and justice. And so brothers and sisters, let's move forward together without leaving anyone behind. Solidarity. Thank you, Winnie, for those sobering yes, and... Yes, there is some that we'll take two here. Uh, okay, we're going to take two questions, I understand. There's one on mic four. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, my name is Maddie Singh. I'm from Harrow Park Local. And the first thing I want to say is I never thought I would see this room where you could hear a pin drop. Yeah. <laughs> really quite amazed. And the other thing I wanted to say is as a grandchild of... Um, uh, indentured laborers, I would, was wondering if you could explain exactly what indentured laborer means and its implications. Indentured labor, okay. Um, maybe I'll get into a very s specific example, and it's very topical right now in BC, right? With um, there's a mine up in northern BC that has got the permissions from Jason Kenney to bring in a group of foreign temporary workers, 200 miners, claiming that we don't have, there are no miners in Canada that can have the expertise. These miners, and I'm, I'm being very clear here, this is not an my statement is not against the miners or against any Chinese workers. These miners have the same owner, the owner that owns the mine, I've been told. It's also the owner of the agency, that are recru the recruiting agency, that are charging these workers 12,000 Canadian dollars for them to come over. So he's... He, He's taking advantage of them on both fronts, being able to pay them much less and also charging them. They, these workers are going to be the indenture labor. They'll be working for the room and board for lower wages, and we're not sure whether they'll get the protections on the health and safety issues, and hopefully the BC ministry is going to look into that. But they are also going to be working to pay back that agency dollars. And if we rewind history back 120, 135 years ago, the building of the Canadian Pacific Railroad, the, the same old Chinese workers <laughs> were the ones who were brought in the same way as indenture labor. So if anyone asks me whether am I opposing all these temporary foreign workers coming in, I would say I, what I oppose is the federal government not having a comprehensive immigration policy. Had all these workers, if the employer could not get away with paying these workers less, I'm sure they won't be brought in. Right? So, I mean, it's... It's, and it's happening every, if we don't, we can't sleepwalk on this. It's happening everywhere. 
in the states now, in the southern states, the rights to work state, they now have teachers being brought in from the Caribbean on a short term contract and healthcare professionals. And it's going to come to a workplace not too soon near you. And so these are the issues that I think the, at the end of the day, the culprit is the federal government. <laughs>